Hello, and welcome to We'll Tell You What We're Reading, our monthly YouTube show in which we tell you what we're reading. My name is Laura Bernheim, and I'm the head of reference at the Waltham Public Library. I am joined today by my colleagues, Liz Rior, Louise Goldstein, and Greg Carter. We, um, this is part of our book club series that we do, and our next meetings are um, July 12th. You can join us for Tell Us What You're Reading on Zoom at 7 p.m. On Saturday, July 10th, we'll be reading The Redhead by the Side of the Road by Ann Tyler. On Thursday, July 15th, we will be reading Liberty by Kaylin Greenidge. And on Monday, July 19th, we'll be reading Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. That is for our sci-fi and fantasy book club. And we'll be back here on Monday, July 26th for We'll Tell You What We're Reading. As always, all of our programs can be found on our library website. We're doing many um, virtual programs as well as some lawn, library lawn in-person programs, including many of our story times as well as some of our English language learning programs. So come join us on the library lawn. Any Zoom links can be found on our website as well as all of our programs. And last but not least, before we introduce the bulk of our program, we always wanna thank our friends. We have wonderful friends of the library. They support our professional Zoom account, which lets us do our YouTube show. They support our museum passes that I know for a fact when working the phones here are very popular with our patrons. They also support a lot of our children's programming, such as our craft materials, as well as many, many other services. Please support and join our friends of the library. Without further ado, we are going to start, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Liz. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all having a great day and keeping cool in the heat of the uh, Northeast and Northwest, or wherever you are. Um, just share my screen. Okay, so if you watch this regularly, you'll know that I usually talk about things like puppies and kittens and ice cream and happy things like that. And we're going to keep that going. Just kidding. Today, we're going to talk about three of my favorite things, which are cults, serial killers, and the apocalypse. So let's jump into it. Content warning for people who are not into those things. Maybe just like mute the audio for a couple moments. Okay, book number one. Don't Call It a Cult by Sarah Berman. So lately, I have been obsessively learning about the Nexium cult, which was founded by Keith Raniere. It started by watching The Vow on HBO and then listening to the podcast Escaping Nexium uh, and finally reading this book. So just a brief explanation of the Nexium cult. Um, it was an American cult that engaged in sex trafficking, forced labor, and racketeering while claiming to be a self-improvement multi-level marketing company. Um, this book is really well written and really infuriating. Um, Nixium was founded and run by people who I swear live exclusively to exploit the people around them in any way possible, financially, emotionally, sexually, intellectually, um, just truly like truly despicable. Um, and to read about the, you know, the way that people who joined this group because they wanted to improve their lives and be, you know, more decisive and, you know, achieve their goals were then just completely taken advantage of is it's really heartbreaking. Um, so it's a emotionally difficult thing to read, um, uh, and oftentimes enraging, but it is a fascinating glimpse into, um, sort of a contemporary cult. Um, so. Yes. All right. My next title, A Serial Killer's Daughter by Kelly Rawson. So I started to be so like jazzed about this. I know it's weird. Um, so we're going to continue on our, our summer trip of all things macabre. So we have this book. So as a child, I was born in 1986. I remember hearing about the horrific murders committed by Dennis Rader, who's more commonly known as BTK, aka Bind, Torture, Kill. Um, Rader was convicted of 10 murders in Wichita, Kansas between 1975 and 1991. He was not apprehended, however, until 2005. Um, so when I heard about him as a child, I was absolutely terrified. He was like my boogeyman because that was the moment when I realized, oh, someone I don't know could try to hurt me and my family. Like the thought had just never come into my mind. 
And then I like, my parents were watching the news with Tom Brokaw and he was talking about this guy. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow, yikes. I'm three or four or five, not into it. Um, so, however, that being said, I was also terrified of the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz and the entire concept of pirates. So like, don't feel bad for me. I was afraid of everything. I, yeah. Um, so this book was written by a uh, Raider's daughter. Um, who she learned her father was a serial killer along with the rest of the world in 2005 when he was apprehended. Um, and it's very interesting to read about this man who I found terrifying and who committed completely atrocious acts um, being a father and sort of the author talking about him fondly is like, oh, this is a trip that we took together. Here's this program that I did that he came to. Here's all the support that he gave me. And then reading about her, her life being shattered when she finds out that her father has actually committed these horrible things and how she sort of had to rebuild her self-confidence and her sense of worth after learning this. Um, it, was, it was good, um, not for everybody. Um, and just very interesting as a look into a, glim a glimpse into sort of the personal life of one of the worst people I have ever heard of. Um, I listened to it on audio through, I believe, um, Hoopla, which is one of the services our library subscribes to, so you can check it out there, but it's also available in print. And then my last book, just ending on a high note, by which I mean the apocalypse, we have Romina by Junji Ito. So this is a graphic novel. Um, an unknown planet emerges from inside a wormhole, and its discoverer, Dr. Oguro, names it Romina after his daughter. His finding is met with great fanfare, and Romina herself rises to fame. However, the object picks up speed as it moves along its curious course, eliminating planets and stars one after another until finally Earth itself faces extinction. As the planet approaches, the people of the world turn against Romina and Dr. Oguro, believing that if Romina dies, the planet will cease its approach. Um, Junji Ito is the master of horror manga uh, and his work is always very disturbing and pretty gross. And this was a solid book, but it, it wasn't on, it was not particularly like remarkable. Um, I, I enjoyed it because it's about this creepy, possibly sentient planet that's going to destroy the world. Like what's not to like. Um, but um, it's, uh, again, everything I read this time is not for everyone. There are some pretty gross scenes in it of just like body horror um, but if you want to read something scary, um, that's a relatively recent graphic novel, this is one you might want to check out. So with my uh, series of horrors now finished, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Greg, who is also my hair twin. And uh, Greg, take it away. Thank you. Um, also, Liz, uh, Ito, yeah, he's, I kind of feel like he's kicked H.P. Lovecraft out the door when it comes to cosmic horror. This, his books are like one of those things where actually, it's one of the few things that I've seen like where an illustration's even worse than just visualizing into your brain. He's just that good. So uh, yeah, well done. All right, I'm gonna set up my stuff. Bear with me one moment, folks. Do, 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 do. PowerPoint with that and all right here we go so for my books um the first one i read was uh anthony bourdain's medium raw um which is the sequel to um his uh best-selling 2001 book i believe uh kitchen confidential um this one he's um he's he's less of a well i hate to use the word less of a chef, but he's more of the celebrity that, you know, people like knew and loved back in this time. Um, it's more about um, him being a father and he um, and traveling the world and his opinions on people that he really likes and also really despises. Um, and I use that word despise very strongly because he uh, he pulls no punches in his opinions. Um, as we all know, like Anthony Bourdain, you know, um, passed away in 2018 by suicide, um, which makes this book, um, even, even though it's a very funny and um, at times very pointed book that seems to be almost prophetic given by what happened to a lot of chefs he talks about, 
um, like whether they would like succeed or fail. Almost all of them did exactly what he said. It is especially heart wrenching when he's talking about his daughter, um, namely because he clearly, you know, in this book, he clearly loves her and is talking about how great of a father he would he he wants to be. And you know, the fact reading this and knowing that that ultimately, uh, ultimately, you know, their time spent together is was tragically cut short. So um, just to be aware of that. Um, the other thing is, is that he is very, very keen on um, comparing the food he loves uh, to, uh, well, there's no way to mince it, uh, se sexual escapades. So uh, if you are not, if that's not your, your cup of tea, I totally, totally understand that. It is kind of shocking, though it can be downright hilarious. <laughs> Um, his metaphors are just kind of like something out of this world. Um, also, he has some very pointed uh, points on generally how um, how food is often appreciated um, from certain cultures, but then those cultures themselves are vilified or, you know, viewed as less. And um, and it's um, something that he um, you know has is very opinionated on and says like. If we're going to be like so obsessed with certain types of food, then we have to also treat the people who provided this within our community with the respect and honor they deserve. So, um, yeah, really liked it. Um, it's just really, really bittersweet reading it. All right. Um, next book. Uh, I just want to um, give a, a little bit of a warning. Um, this book's uh, title is um, as a well, as a swear word, so if you do not, and it's kind of just right there on the front cover. So if that stuff, um, you know, offends you, totally, totally understand. You might want to, uh, you know, um, mute this and uh, just, uh, or maybe uh, wait like a couple minutes. So here we go. Next one. Lindy West. Um, shit, actually. Uh, so, um, it is the definitive 100% objective guide to modern cin cinema. Uh, she, Lindy West is um, a, uh, Lindy West is um, essentially a, um, oh, sorry, there we go, is, oh, my bad, is a, oh dear. Sorry guys, lost that for a sec. There we go. Uh, can we see that now? Awesome. So, as I was saying, Lindsay West is a political commentator who um, is writes a lot of comedic stuff, but she also writes a lot of serious stuff. And um, what happened was is that during the 2020 pandemic. Um, she decided she was going to take a break on um, understandably dark subjects and go into reading um, some of the, uh, uh, like some lighthearted stuff from her childhood, um, stuff that people have been telling her that she should like generally uh, watch and just write her opinions and comments on it. Um, and as a result, uh, she wrote them down and presented them to us in this book. Uh, my warning is obviously um, if you don't like vulgar language, you probably shouldn't read this, though I will admit it is nowhere near as uh, raunchy as Anthony Bourdain's book. Um, but uh, yeah, she's, uh, she doesn't pull any punches. Uh, Love Actually is one of the uh, books you can tell that she uh, reviews. Um, surprisingly, she doesn't like it. Uh, and she says uh, in no, um, in, like no lighthearted ways why she thinks it's bad. Um, she reviews Forrest Gump or her title for it is, dude, you gotta stop listening to your mom. Um, another one is The Rock, which is entitled Men Yelling, Men Yelling, Men Yelling. Um, that, that's very suitable. Um, and um, then there's, there's her um, chapter uh, called On Marriage. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what book she no, I mean, what movie she's reviewing for that? Because it is one of the funniest chapters of a book I have ever read. I was laughing so hard I was crying, 
because it's just a punchline. So just do yourself a favor and read this book. It's gonna, if you're feeling down, it's gonna make you feel a lot better. Um, the only caveat I would say, addition from the book, from some of the swearing is if you actually want to like see any of these movies, you might wanna you might wanna watch them first because the fact of the matter is is that she goes into detail picking apart the plot and the beginning, the middle, and the end. So there's a there's spoilers abound. Like if you don't know what happened at the end of Forrest Gump, you're gonna know. So uh, yeah, um, uh, two thumbs up. And finally, last but definitely not least, Kings of the Wild by uh, Nicholas Eames. So. Um, as we all know, I'm the science fiction and fantasy uh, um, librarian, I, for lack of a better term here. Um, and uh, um, so obviously, you know, I've got a reputation to maintain. So um, this is a second read for me. Um, this book is a uh, second reread. Uh, this is a book that um, pretty much takes place in a typical fantasy setting. It um, uh, there's this uh, protagonist by the name of uh, Clay Cooper. He's a pretty chill dude, just, um, you know, working, working as a guard, as a wife, as a kid. Um, you wouldn't know anything about it, but as it turns out, he used to be uh, pretty big about 20 years ago. He was in a band of heroes who pretty much just kind of toured the world slaying monsters and just, you know, getting, getting you know, gold, fame, fortune, all, all that good stuff. Um, However, uh, life happened, they all got old and they all went on their separate ways. Um, so Clay's pretty much pretty comfortable being like a middle-aged dad, you know, no longer killing monsters, uh, you know, raising his daughter until his friend uh, Gabe comes back. And Gabe was, used to be like this big hotshot um, hero, maybe like the hero, but he's unfortunately kind of like, a hollow shell of what he once was. He's kind of, he's practically homeless. He's like living off like the, uh, he's living off like, you know, the charity of other people. And he's just found out that his daughter has followed in his footsteps and she's trying to be like a great hero. And she is pretty much like defending this castle from like something called the Heart Wild Horde. And uh, long story short, every monster that you thought might be under your bed Com is com is what this army is composed of. And they've brought friends and they're pretty much just going to go to this castle she's trapped in, burn it to the ground and kill and eat everybody who's in there. So as they say, Gabe and, and Clay got to get the band back together. Um, and unfortunately the problem is, is that, you know, they're kind of old and out of shape. Uh, their friend Maverick, who's like the team rogue, he's, he's really out of shape. Uh, their friend Moog the wizard is, um, He's kind of been locked in the tower for about 10 years and that, that doesn't do, you know, mental sanity for anybody. And Ganelon, who's like the final member of the group, he's every bit as awesome and tough as, as he was in the past, but they didn't exactly like part ways on, a, um, on good terms. And it's very likely he could be more dangerous than any monster they encounter. So as you can tell, there's a lot of rock star references. Um, th the bands of heroes are literally like XPs of like, you know, heavy metal bands. Uh, you could pretty much listen to 70s rock and be like content for this. Um, I really did think, you know, when I first read it, I wasn't a huge fan, but reading it now, I really did like it. I think it's very easy for anybody get to get into. The characters are very fleshed out. Um, there's a lot of heartwarming moments in a world that is very dark. I think like friendship and accepting that you're getting older and still finding out that there is a purpose for yourself, it's, it's very nice. There's also, um, there's also a lot of great queer representation that I feel like is, doesn't always get, is not always like treated well when it comes to fantasy books, but I think that this one does a pretty good job. So um, yeah, give it, give it a, give it a read. Um, and uh, you know, uh, if um, you know, fighting man-eating cyclopses are your, is your jam, you're gonna love this. All right, so thank you for your time. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Louise. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, Liz. So many interesting titles. I'm interested in the Nexium cult. Um, I may pick up that book. And uh, let's see if we can get this going now. 
uh, hold on one sec, you guys. That was my last slide. Oops, you're all getting a preview. All right, all right, here we go. So here is the first book I, I want to talk about. This book, um, I'm showing you here the, uh, the cover for the English translation. And this book was originally written in Russian. The two authors are a married couple and um, Marina and Sergei Dayachenko, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If you guys are listening, I apologize. <laughs> um, and it was translated by Julia Maton. And, um, you know, so this is a book that you're reading in translation. So uh, my guess, my guess is she did a fantastic job because I loved, 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 loved this book. Um, this is not a book like any book I've ever read. Um, apparently the, the genre, um, the, it's a Ukrainian genre and it's called Fantaskaya and it encompasses um, science fiction, fantasy, horror, and folkloric traditions. So what a mixture. Um, there are those who say, oh, this is like um, Harry Potter meets Kafka or something, but it, it's not like Harry Potter. I actually, um, uh, I don't wanna, no disrespect to Harry Potter. When my kid was little, I listened to all the, uh, the audios, we saw the movies. Jim Dale did a great job reading that, by the way. Um, but uh, for this adult, my money's on Vita Nostra because it goes dark and it, it explores all kinds of interesting issues. Um, I just wanna tell you this quote from the authors because I think this is part of what they're exploring in this book. The quote is, free will demands the existence of evil. Evil is horrible, death is inevitable, but in their absence, there is no possibility of choice or willpower. Intellectually, we understand that this is the most ancient principle of the world order, but to us, it seems emotionally infuriating. And I love that because this book, I mean, we've got this young girl, she's 16, she's in Crimea. Her name is um, Sasha, and she, Sasha Samokina, and she goes with her mother to the seashore. They're not particularly wealthy. Um, their father left, her father, the girl, Sasha's father had left the family, so he's not there. Um, they go to stay in this hotel on the seashore. They actually have to share, share their lodgings with another couple who stay out till all hours doesn't matter they're very happy and even the fact that it's in Crimea I mean even the snacks that they have on the beach I found so interesting because it's not the same as we are you know they're having like corn on the cob uh you know on the beach it's not something that we tend to do um everything's going great Sasha's so happy her mother's so happy it's all good however then there's a man in dark sunglasses who seems to be following Sasha, who is kind of creeped out. She's getting a bad vibe. She tells her mother about it. Her mother's like, eh, it's nothing. It's just a man in sunglasses, whatever. Oh my God, was her mother wrong? At some point, he, he gets her attention and he tells her, he kind of, kind of makes her an offer she can't refuse type of thing because um, what she has to do is she has to get up in the morning at 4 a.m. She has to go to the seashore. She has to take off all her clothes. She has to swim from the shore to the buoy and back every night. And if she doesn't do that, something might happen to someone in her family that wouldn't be very good. So this is a tough offer to turn down. So she's doing it. And each time she comes back from the swim, she throws up gold coins with particular markings in them. And she has to save these gold coins for Farid. And so she does this. One night she oversleeps, the alarm clock doesn't go off. Oh my God, OMG. 4 a.m. comes and goes, she doesn't do it. She goes to see Farid, she's like, I, I overslept. I meant to get there. He goes, well, it's bad but it could have been a lot worse. And then there's an ambulance in front of her hotel 
and there is oh I, I I didn't mention the her mother meets a gentleman and the gentleman that the mother has met oops he's in the ambulance so there's a consequence but he doesn't die it just turns out he had a heart attack and it turns out he's married her mother didn't know that and the whole family comes and takes him away so now Sasha knows that she really has to do whatever Farid says or else. Um, and then when she gets home, oh, and there's there's more to it than that. Though. My God, my God, I could go on and on about all the things. But basically, it's a very interesting book. Sasha ends up having to go to his school, which is the Institute of Special Technologies. Uh, and there's a street in the in the place where she goes for the school that is called Sacco and Vanzetti Street. And I believe they did that on purpose, I think because Sacco and Vanzetti got accused of murder, um, but they may not have been the murderers and the trial may have been a botched thing. And I think that's something about the, you know, good and bad, right and wrong, fair and unfair. I think they're, they're sort of wrestling with that. Meantime, in the school, they're, they're learning kind of magic. This is the Harry Potter analogy. Um, Lev Grossman, uh, the author of the book, The Magicians, which I did read, um, is apparently a big fan of this book, which is, I think, different than The Magicians because it goes way darker. Um, and I prefer this book personally. Um, um, but these kids are in the school, have all been sort of drafted into the school by force, are all learning these odd, odd things. For example, uh, Sasha gets this book and nobody can understand the letters and the words in this book. Like nobody can understand it and they're required to memorize it, all of it. It's all gobbledygook that you can't understand a thing and you have to memorize it. Thing is, Sasha is a very advanced student and she actually starts getting really into this and um, things unfold. I was on the edge of my seat all through the book, totally on the edge of my seat, so fascinated. I really recommend this book. It's like no other book I've ever written in my life. Um, really, really good. All right, and the next book that I wanted to talk about is, um, so I read uh, this year for the first time that classic book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. And I loved that book. I absolutely loved it. And so I took this out, um, Philip K. Dick, a comics biography. It's a graphic novel. And um, it was really, really fun. And I, I need to read more by Philip K. Dick, I think, but it tells us about his life. Um, he had a tough life, apparently, when he was born. Um, he was like a preemie and he had a twin sister um, who unfortunately died. So I think that affected his life, knowing that there was a twin who died. I think that affected his life and his writing. Um, as he's growing up, his parents also got divorced. He ends up being raised exclusively by his mother. It seems that um, one of the themes he he likes to explore is the idea that the world is not entirely real and there is no way to confirm whether it's really even here. And um, so you're exploring a concept like that and you're abusing amphetamines, uh, that can lead to trouble. Um, he had some very troubled relationships. He had five different wives, which is a lot of wives. And um, he had a couple of suicide attempts, which is very sad. And, um, um, I, I am embarrassed to say I didn't see the movie Blade Runner, but that is apparently based on Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. And sadly, that film actually came out after he already died because he had a stroke, um, unfortunately, and he died. Um, but he, he was brilliant. And um, I guess one of his books, The Man in the High Castle, won a Hugo Award. And um, I guess Amazon did some kind of a series that was based on Man in the High Castle, which I haven't seen. And of course, he wrote a short story named Minority Report. And interestingly, the film Minority Report is based on that short story. Um, 
he he uh, he got kind of cosmic in his time. Like he saw a woman who had a necklace one time and there was like a pink beam on it and he felt that it gave him psychic powers. And I know this sounds crazy, but the only thing is he actually, after that happened, he, he told his wife, our son is ill and nobody knew her son, his son was ill. And it turned out the son really was ill when they brought him to the hospital. So he seemed to have a little bit of a psychic something, at least in that one moment. And he started to believe he was having parallel lives at one point that he was, he was, you know, he was Philip K. Dick, but he was also Thomas Christensen being persecuted by Romans in the first century AD. So he had some very unusual ideas. He seems like a very interesting guy. I'm almost interested to read a biography of him because this was kind of a brief capturing kind of his personal life more than anything, his, his uh, troubles, his ideas, his writing. Um, I think he felt that the amphetamines helped him write more, greater vo volume, literate pun intended, you know, more volumes. Um, but I don't think it did his health any good. Very interesting book, quick read. Um, and the last book I wanna talk about is called The Affinities by Robert Charles Wilson, who is a very well-respected science fiction writer. Um, I have not read any of his other books before, but I really liked this one. Um, Apparently he's noted for um, doing a good job sort of getting into the, the personal lives of his characters. And he certainly does this here with his main character, Adam. Um, we definitely get a sense of his life. We, we know that he grew up with a very conservative and rather cold father. We know he has um, a sort of a half brother um, from the father's second marriage um, who is kind of maybe um, on the spectrum or something. And his father's rather nasty to his brother and he's protective of, of his brother. But um, he's rather lonely in this household with this father who's very different from him where he, he wants to be a graphic artist and his father doesn't support that sort of a career. He thinks that's just silly, but he has a grandmother who helped pay for his schooling and he goes to school in Canada but his grandmother dies and his father says, you know, I'm not gonna support any more of that silly school. And just around that time, he decides to join the affinities. He takes this test. They have a test to see if you can match up with one of these affinities. And he ends up testing well. They, they do these psychometric associative tests and they do brain mapping, blood samples, genetic, testing. It's a multi-day process. And he turns out to get into a tranche, they call it an affinity, and his tranche is Tau. And he feels like this is his family. And um, this is this sort of idealistic idea that people can place into affinities and be very happy and the world will be better. But the only problem is there are people who don't place into any affinity and those people resent not being in an affinity. And of course, as happens with human beings, there are struggles from one affinity to another affinity. And the Tao affinity, one expects the Tao people expect you to not ever put anything above your affinity, even family, if your family's having trouble. You, they're not your family, only the affinity is your family. And this is very difficult for Adam. There are some tough things that happen in his family and he, he can't really buy into that when push comes to shove. He's willing to help his family, his biological family, despite the issues there. And I, I just like this book um, quite a bit. It uh, sort of shows us the good and the bad, the, the human condition, you know, utopian ideas and how they don't always pan out in the end, you know? <laughs> and uh, with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pass on to my esteemed colleague, Laura. Thank you, Louise. Um, I just want to point out, since Liz had commented on Greg being her hair twin, I've also noticed that everyone, uh, we all have curly hair. <laughs> so yay, curly hair. Um, let me get started here. All right. 
So my first book is Our Team, The Epic Story of Four Men in the World Series that Changed Baseball by Luke Eplin. Um, on the surface, this is the story of the 1948 Cleveland baseball team and three of its players, as well as its owner, um, Larry Doby, Satchel Paige, Bob Feller, and Bill Veck. Uh, 1948 was the last time that uh, that Cleveland won a World Series. And it was a year that was talked about a lot amongst my Cleveland relatives, most especially my great uncle Harry, who's a huge baseball fan. Um, I have to say this Red Sox fan actually was jealous of the fact that their World Series, that their team had won the World Series so recently being haunted by 1918 for most of my life. Um, obviously that all changed in 2004 and yay. Um, however, this is not about me or the Red Sox. Um, this book is much more than the story of a World Series run or really even baseball. Uh, Larry Do Doby, for those who are not familiar, was the first black player to play in the American League. Um, he arrived um, into the Cleveland clubhouse on July 5th, 1947, which is actually fewer than three months after Jackie Robinson made his debut with the Brooklyn Dodgers team. Um, I, I, know, I knew about Doby, um, but I'm surprised by how many people I speak to don't know him, especially those who call themselves baseball fans. And I really think he needs to get um, a lot more of his due um, with, uh, the, with his uh, history fans. And of course, Satchel Paige, who I hope most people have heard of, um, he was one of the greatest pitchers of all time, not just one of the greatest Negro League stars, and he broke with Cleveland in 1948 at 42 years old after 22 years in the Negro Leagues and barnstorming. And barnstorming is actually, I'm sorry, there's an ambulance behind me. I don't know if that's coming through, but I apologize. Uh, barnstorming um, is where uh, Paige met Cleveland pitcher Bill Bob Feller, sorry. And then rounding out our cast is Bill Veck, who's probably best known as being a baseball owner who came up with very unusual um, and often silly promotions to sell tickets. Um, a lot of his siller antics actually inspired his son, Mike Beck, who is a PR person for the Chicago White Sox, who put together the infamous disco demolition night in Comiskey Park in 1979. And if you don't know about Comiskey Park's disco demolition night, I highly recommend that you Google it because it's one of Major League Baseball's uh, weirder controversies. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, I recommend this title for anyone who is interested in a well-rounded look at U.S. history, even if you're not a baseball fan, although how dare you if you're not. Best sport ever. Sorry, fight me on that. The story and personalities in this book tell a tale of institutional racism, the after effects of World War II, especially for the soldiers, um, especially um, for those who don't know, World War II, we still had segregated um, troops at that time, uh, business history, and also the Midwest. Um, the dichotomy illustrated here is also very interesting um, since Cleveland, or really more uh, Bill Veck, is uh, characterized as being somewhat progressive, especially for the time, um, especially when it comes to signing black players compared to say <coughs> the Red Sox, uh, who were the last team to sign a black player. Um, and yet for so long, the Cleveland baseball team uh, has been known, uh, we all know what their name is, um, which is changing after this season. Um, we don't know what it is yet. And up until very recently used a very offensive um, Native American caricature as their logo. Um, so again, interesting dichotomy, I feel. Um, I feel like this book is also timely as well as Major League Baseball is finally recognizing uh, the Negro League as a major league and is actually recognizing the um, the records as actual records um, in um, including the records from the National and American Leagues, uh, something that is long overdue. Uh, so read it, baseball and non-baseball fans alike. Come on, sorry. Oh, there we go. So my next set of books um, are the Harriet the Spy trilogy by Louise Fitzhugh. Uh, Harriet the Spy, The Long Secret and Sport. During our, I believe it was our April broadcast, I discussed the Louise Fitzhugh biography, Sometimes You Have to Lie. Reading that inspired me to reread these three titles. Although in the case, I think Sport may have been a first read. It wasn't familiar to me at all when I read it. Um, 
And her um, knowing her life story really added a context to these books that I did not previously know. Um, and I have to say Harriet the Spy especially holds up really well as mainly does The Long Secret. Um, Harriet M. Welsh um, loves tomato sandwiches and writing in her notebook about the going-ons of her neighbors and her classmate, classmates, and she gets into a bit of hot water when a classmate comes across her notebook and reads it out loud to everyone else in the school. What I like about the first two books is that the kids in it seem very real to me in terms of their personalities, and that the adults, while rather quirky and bizarre, are still three-dimensional. I also love, love the advice that Harriet's former nurse slash nanny, old golly, gives her regarding making up with her classmates after they find the notebook. She tells her, one, you have to apologize. Two, you have to lie. That's the most real thing ever. And I love that Fitzhugh did not condescend to her readers regarding human nature or getting along in the world. And I say, I mean, Harriet the Spy was actually written in the 60s. And I think it, for the most part, holds up really well. A uh, sport uh, is a bit of, I think, the outlier in this series. Um, it was published posthumously. Um, and it was, it, it shows, um, it clearly was not really finished or polished. And I appreciate some aspects of the novel and even what the premise is trying to do, which I won't get too much into, but um, and I like that sports friends are actually a lot more diverse than they are in the first two books. Um, especially I think his sport uh, goes to public school in this book where he was in a very elite private school in the first two novels. Um, but, the, the aspect of all the characters, both the adults and the children, are pretty one-dimensional, and the book ends really abruptly. Overall, though, um, it didn't really take away from my experience of these three books, and I'm really glad that I revisited or visited um, them in the case of sport. I will add, there are other books in the Harriet the Spy series, um, but they were written well after Louise Fitzhugh died, and um, are so I don't, when I think of the, so Harry the Spy books, I generally think of the ones written by Louise Fitzhugh. I have not re read the ones that were written. Um, they were published somewhat recently. And so I don't have anything good or bad to say about them. But if anyone wants to write in the chat that I am missing books, yes, I do know that there are other books published. Um, my third title is Malice by Heather Walter. And this is a retelling of Sleeping Beauty with a little bit of Cinderella and others thrown in just for good measure. Alice is the dark race or, or briar and, um, and who can only, she's a dark race or briar who can only perform curses. Her fellow graces can all perform charms and happy things. She does the opposite. Um, she falls in love with Princess Aurora, that name may sound familiar, and the feeling is mutual. Um, this descriptive novel is honestly very refreshing, original, and despite the fact it's based on some well-known fairy tales, I actually found it very different. Uh, the world building is especially impressive. I really like this take on Sleeping Beauty versus some others, Maleficent, for example. However, without giving away spoilers, I mean, maybe this is a big one. I will say, if you're one of those people who hated the penultimate episode of Game of Thrones for one particular reason, and are still mad about it three years later now, two years later, uh, you may have a similar reaction to the climax of the novel. I will say this does have a sequel uh, coming out, but yeah, I just says a lot of people were with that second to last episode of Game of Thrones, where where did that come from? Kind of the same here, but I'll reserve judgment till I read the sequel. And my last title is Rainbow Milk by Paul Mendez. Uh, this was originally published in the UK, um, but was recently published in the United States. Uh, Rainbow Milk is the story, or two stories, um, one of Norman Alonzo and then later Jesse McCarthy, both residents of the Black Country section of Birmingham, England. Uh, Norman has moved to the United Kingdom from Jamaica in order for his family to have a better life, their life, and finds it's not the land of hopes and dreams, he thought. Several years later, Jesse has left the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, something ha that has caused him to be estranged from his family and has turned to a life of sex work. He does so down with Owen, but he, his, um, his journey and really um, struggling with what being in that Jehovah's Witness, how that was such a part of his life um, meant to him um, really gets uh, still very 
covered a lot. Um, this is extremely detailed and character driven novel with a strong sense of place, highly, highly recommended. And those are my titles. So if anyone has some TV shows that they would like to share, anyone? Craig, I know you had a couple. I do. Um, so, well, not TV shows, but movies. Uh, that counts, right? Yeah, cool. So um, my, uh, my wife and I kind of did like a little bit of a trade-off. I'd watch one movie she wanted to watch, and, uh, I, and uh, I'd watch one movie that, um, you know, We'd want uh, we'd both watch one movie that I wanted to watch. So, her movie we watched *Romancing the Stone*, um, which is uh, with uh, Michael Douglas and shoot, um, is it Kathleen Turner? Kathleen Turner, yes. And uh, so you know it's um, and Danny DeVito. <laughs> I, I can't forget Danny DeVito. Um, so. Long story short, um, it Kathleen Turner is a pretty successful. Um, romance author and uh, living in New York. And she finds out that her sister's been uh, captured by some shady people. She has to go down to South America, you know, with, um, with this uh, mysterious map um, in order to get her safely um, out there safely. And um, on the way, she encounters all sorts of bad guys, including Danny DeVito, who's just great in this. He's, it's just, it's, it's Danny DeVito. You can't go wrong with him. Um, and she's saved by Michael Douglas, who is um, just this uh, dude living in the uh, in the forest. Um, he he is not at all like you know like her uh, you know male protagonists in her romances. You know, he is not chivalrous. He he is definitely likes money, um, and he has little time for you know um, chivalrous concepts or anything like that. However. You know, while they're trying to serve, while they get kind of roped in and trying to like survive all the baddies that are coming after, they, you know, that hardened exterior begins to soften and they begin to, you know, develop feelings. And you know how this is going. But in any case, um, I really liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's it's got some it's got some action. Um, it's got it's got a lot of heart to it. Um, and it's very obvious that like the the actors are having a lot of fun with this. There's a great um, chemistry between uh, Michael Michael Douglas and um, and uh, Kathleen Turner. Um, they make it very believable. Um, there is there is some scenes involving crocodiles that are terrifying. Um, if I have one complaint about it, it's that like uh, Miss Turner when she comes to when she comes to like South I'm mean, not South. South America, not um, South America. She, um, she's. We. It's made out that she obviously doesn't understand like where she's going. But I'm pretty sure that even like the most oblivious person would recognize you do not wear a fur coat and high heels when running through the tropics of South America. Um, and it's just like. But you know, I guess it's something to be said, but. Whatever, it, I think it's uh, just to show she's clueless. So um, in it, uh, but anyway, yeah, definitely recommend, thumbs up. Uh, the second uh, movie I watched was <laughs> was The Rock, um, starring Nicolas Cage and the late Sean Connery. And um, and I just wanna say this right here, I, I am not a Michael Bay fan. I really do not like his work, but The Rock is this one exception and uh, in order to describe my feelings about The Rock, I was wondering if I may share like um, like a little passage from Lindsay West's uh, review of it because she does do that. Is that all right? All right, so here we go. Look, is The Rock a perfect movie? No, but is it a perfect movie? Maybe, just describing the plot plot of The Rock is a lush, lip-smacking thrill, like a piece of bacon that is all fatty rind, like a bowl of Lucky Charms that is all marshmallows. So many elements that could each alone be too much here combined into one film that somehow works, one great cinnamon roll that is all the middle of the cinnamon roll. The Jetsons meet the Flintstones, a duck-billed platypus, a place beyond decadence, faux gras on your burger, everything you want and nothing you don't, and then there's some more. Nicolas Cage, an unchained freak. Sean Connery, virtuosely hammy. Ed Harris, a haunting prince going down with his ship. Anti-hero versus anti-hero versus the president. 
<laughs> it's just, and uh, it's pretty much, um, it, it's just pretty much exactly that. The quickly summarized, because I'm going on way too long. The Rock is pretty much, Ed Harris is this retired military general who's like been in all the wars, like all of them. And uh, he decides that um, his boys haven't gotten the proper respect that they deserve. So he kidnaps a bunch of people on Alcatraz um, who are going on a tour. And he says, you got to give me like all these families, like a million dollars to, you know, take care of these folks. Otherwise, I'm going to launch poison neurotoxins on like San Francisco. So they hire Nicolas Cage because Nicolas Cage is the one dude who knows about this neurotoxin. And they're like, oh, but how do we... Um, get on the rock we don't know how to get in and it's like well we have to hang and we have to find the one man who escaped the rock sean connery and he's in like a cell and he's hiding there and they have to get him out and it's the one movie where nick cage and sean connery teamed up a uh, fun fact i keep saying that sean connery is the only man to ever escape alcatraz no it, it probably was five but throw logic out the window you don't you don't need that for this movie it's it's just i can't there's a mining shaft in Alcatraz. I do not understand why there is, but you just, you enjoy it. It's great. I just, Maggie loved it. She normally does not love these movies, but she loved it. So yeah, uh, watch it. And I'm gonna, I'm re, I'm just yammering. So I'm just gonna be quiet. Uh, take um, that, um, I have to say that I was already wanting to read Lindy West's book after your review, but, and actually since it came out, but, I definitely want to read it now after hearing um, the small snippet. Um, I'm embarrassed that I've never seen The Rock. Um, I feel like I very much have to. I'm also not a Michael Bay fan, but I have, I'm a Nicolas Cage fan kind of, just because he's Nicolas Cage. Um, yes. So uh, I don't know who I was having a conversation about Face Off with recently, but it seems to be everyone's movie that they love to hate watch is kind of the impression I get from it. Are you, and, Greg, yeah, you're having a reaction. Yeah. So. He, Lindy, Lindy West reviews Face Off. She called <laughs> um, uh, Freaky Friday uh, men, adult men style. So there you go. <laughs> That's a great description. Um, so yes, I, um, and I'm actually curious, Greg, since you watch Romancing the Stone, have you seen War of the Roses with the same exact cast? <laughs> I have not. I've just watched, I only recently just watched uh, that one. So we haven't watched that yet. That could be on the table. I gotta, we will, uh, I'll talk to Maggie about that. Uh, we might have to have another viewing. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's a great movie. I don't know if anyone else here has seen War of the Roses, but it's definitely um, a little sick for lack of a better word. Um, it's basically a couple played by Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner decide to get divorced, but they're living in their dream house. So they both stay in the house and they, um, they have a very, very over the top uh, divorce. And it's what they do to each other to try to get the other one to move out is awful. But, um, and Dan DeVito plays their friend slash, I believe in a, a divorce lawyer, it's been years, but they, um, and of course the three of them were in Jewel of the Nile as well together, which was the sequel to Romancing the Stones. So uh, they have, the three of them have great chemistry. And I guess Kathleen Turner, I haven't seen it, but Michael Douglas has a show on Netflix and Kathleen Turner, I believe is in the latest season. <laughs> so lots of opportunities for uh, Douglas and Turner. Um, one show that I've been watching, um, I feel like we can't have one of these go by without me mentioning a Disney Plus show. Um, I am watching Loki, I know, um, it's, I think, only has four episodes so far. I've only seen three. I like it. I think it's probably my least favorite of the Marvel shows that have happened during this go around. I'm not counting Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Agent Carter, but it, um, so there's WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier and now Loki. I do like it mainly because I think Tom Hiddleston is a really good actor and I think he really plays that character with such joy. Um, for those who are not familiar, um, he, play that character in all three of the Thor movies, as well as uh, two of the event or three of the Avengers movies, sorry. And it's decent. It does, it talks a lot about time travel. And I feel like sometimes shows make my head hurt with them trying to talk about the rules of time travel, because I feel like every show has its own rules about it. And what I liked about Avengers Endgame is it basically said, there are no rules, who cares? And I feel like this show is completely contradicting that. Um, but it's still entertaining enough. I don't 
Greg, I think you mentioned you were watching. I don't know if you have any thoughts to add to that, but. I've only watched two episodes, so I am trying to hold like my final commentary on it, but yeah, I kind of feel that way. I mean, yeah. obviously I love Tom Hiddleston and he and Owen Wilson have a good dynamic, but time travel is just kind of, it's one of the few science fiction like genres that I'm not a huge fan of because it's like, it invalidates what was done with that you got invested in. And I just, I don't like that. I, I just, I think it makes, it makes good parts that have happened like minute and it makes, um, tragic events lose their potency. So, and you know, again, like Endgame, it just kind of, it was one of the few moments where I was like, no, they, they did it in a way that it didn't generally annoy me. So doing this, I'm kind of like, eh. I was kind of hoping Loki would be more like mythological Nordic stuff, but as Liz knows, that's because that's my jam. So I was just kind of like, ah, I want my frost giants back. Give, give me those and giant wolf monsters, but you know, it's, it's Tom Hiddleston, and he's just so charming that it's kind of like, all right, I'll watch it, but really that's kind of the thing. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. Um, good plug, by the way, um, if anyone likes, it's Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. Um, is a great um, sort of modern retelling of Norse mythology without Marvel. Uh, so, and Het Loki uh, features very heavily in that novel. Um, I'm also just watching, um, I did watch In the Heights, I feel like as a lot of people did. Um, I mainly really enjoyed it. Um, I know there was a lot of discourse about it and I, I'm not gonna get too much into that, but um, I, I think for the most part, I, I really did enjoy the movie. Uh, I very, um, a little different than the play, if anyone has seen that, um, they made some choices, but I, yeah, I mean, Great music. Um, I think I might like it better than Hamilton. Don't at me. Uh, I feel like that's a hot take <laughs> regarding Lynn Manuel Miranda's um, over, over um, but I did like Hamilton, but I, I really did enjoy In the Heights, both the show and the movie. And um, I'm watching Kim's Convenience right now on Netflix. Um, for those who don't know that show, um, it's actually um, from Canada. It's about a family, a Korean Canadian family who owns a uh, convenience store in Toronto. Um, it's a sitcom and I, I just, I really like it. I really like the characters. Um, I like the relationships between all of them. And I'm still only in the first season. There are five seasons so far, um, but definitely recommend. And you can actually watch anything on Netflix or Disney Plus. Um, if you don't have it, um, we have Roku's at the library that have both those streaming services. So definitely check those out. And speaking of library thing stuff, I think uh, Liz, right, wanted to share. That is true. I actually just checked out a Disney Plus Roku today so that I can start watching Loki and actually watch Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which I haven't watched yet. Sorry. Um, okay. So recently I watched something using an item from our library of things. And that item was a set of binoculars. And the thing I watched was a mother and a baby whale feeding off the coast. I went on a whale watch for the first time in like 20 years. And it was amazing because I love nature. Um, and I'm so glad I checked out these binoculars because my vision is terrible, even with corrective lenses. And our binoculars are good enough quality that like when the whales surfaced, like I could see like the barnacles like on that were like on them. Um, and it was just so cool. I was like, please, I don't wanna drop these in the ocean uh, because that would have been a bummer. And I didn't, yay me. Um, and yeah, it was just really lovely and they worked like a charm. Um, so that's my plug for the binoculars, 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 the sweet knocks in our library of things. And then a film I watched recently was on HBO. Um, it's The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It uh, because I love excessively long film franchises. Uh, earlier, I talked about how I was rewatching all the Hellraiser films as well as all of the Paranormal Activity films. So this is set in the Conjuring universe of Ed and Lorraine Warren, two people who are real, whether or not the exploits they had were grounded in reality or not is up for debate. But um, this most recent uh, edition has to do sort of with demonic possession, but also witches. And it's kind of a hot mess, but overall I enjoyed it because it's just a horror movie that you don't have to think about really. And what more could you want in life? I don't know. That's kind of all I need. 
So only watch it if you've like seen the other films and you're ready to put up with a lot of gaps in in the plot. There's a lot of holes. But um, yeah, that's what I've been watching other than baby whales frolicking in the Atlantic Ocean. I am, I do, <laughs> I, I have HBO and I, I've been seeing a lot of ads for their movies that they have on HBO Max, which is actually how I watched In the Heights. And uh, yeah, The Contrary. <laughs> I feel like that one is being plugged more than any other movie, except for maybe the Zack Snyder Justice League. Like, aside from that one, I just feel like con they're constantly, like even, yes. Um, and I love the subtitle, The Devil Made Me Do It, just makes me laugh. The preview makes me laugh. I, I have not actually seen the other movies, but I, if, like I'm already paying for this anyway. I may just watch it, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, anything else to share? Yeah, Louise, go ahead. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, this is not a movie either, but um, I recently actually took out our Massachusetts State Parks Pass and um, I went to Hopkinton State Park. And um, yeah, uh, just for everybody to know, like if you're a Waltham resident, you can get our Massachusetts State Park Pass and there are a ton of wonderful Massachusetts State Parks, including of course, Walden Pond. But I went to Hopkinton State Park and um, you know, uh, my friend and I, we were walking on some nice, you know, they have like some trails and we came out of this one trail and there was this huge reservoir um, and there are boats, so you can boat there. They have um, kayaks and they have other kinds of boats as well. Um, and there were cute dogs swimming in the water and there were people swimming and I jumped in. It was my first uh, dip of the year and uh, it was so fun. And I really, it's a huge, huge park. I, I feel like I've just scraped the surface. So I recommend our Massachusetts State Park Pass. Um, by the way, if you're 62 and older, which I qualify, um, apparently you can get a pass uh, by mail with them, but it takes like six to eight weeks, but it's like $12 or some crazy thing. So that's another good thing, but you could just take out our pass much better. Well, that is actually a great note to end on and a great segue because that pass that Louise just mentioned was sponsored and paid for by the Friends of the Waltham Public Library. So if you join them, you can support wonderful programs like Louise just mentioned, our past program. So thank you. We didn't even plan that. That was perfect. So thank you all as usual for joining us. Um, as our, you can watch this anytime on demand if you missed anything in our live broadcast, as well as you can watch all of our previous episodes, if you will, on um, the Waltham Public Library YouTube channel, um, as well as any program that we have done that we have done on YouTube in the last year. Um, if you like it, this video or if you subscribe to our channel, you will automatically be notified whenever we do have a new video. So I very much recommend subscribing to the Waltham Public Library. You will not regret it. Um, and we will be here next month on July 26th at 2.30 p.m. again for live, but you can always watch us on demand. Um, and if anyone would like to share their titles, um, on July 12th at 7 p.m., we will be having our Tell Us What You're Reading book club meeting in which um, staff as well as um, library users um, share anything they've been reading or watching as well. And that Zoom link is on our website or you can email me. Um, my email is actually on our library website as well and I can send the link to you. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Do the Zoom wave. Bye.